Vermonters have done a lot to suppress this virus and help us contain the small number of outbreaks we've had to prevent it from gaining much traction. But looking across the country, we continue to see a forest fire spreading in the south and west, and things could shift back towards us. So we have to keep our guard up, because I know every Vermonter wants to move forward, not backward. As I said, that's why we're closely watching these trends and working to protect the progress we've made if this fire does spread back towards us. And alongside these national trends, we know our colleges and universities are getting ready to restart. And we want to have K through 12 schools open for at least some level of in-person instruction this fall. So it's crucial we keep community spread low as more people begin to interact with one another. We fought back against this invisible enemy since March, gaining more ground each week methodically step by step, but each of us must do all we can to protect the gains we've made so we can continue to open the economy. Over the last weeks and months, we've been working on ways to strengthen our ability to suppress the virus, including increased testing and contact tracing. We've also made it clear that we expect buyers to be compliant with our safety measures. As other states have warned, these establishments are contributing significantly to the resurgence they're seeing. We've opened in a measured way to keep from having to take a step back. But again, as we welcome back more college students, we're looking at methods and strategies that will help prevent increases that exceed our ability to contain spread. I'm sure it comes as no surprise another option we're considering is expanding our existing mask mandates. As I've said, this is a tool we have in the toolbox. And with every health decision we've made, when to use that tool will be driven by the data. My concern has been that a mandate will create unnecessary conflict. And with the numbers we see in Vermont, particularly in our most rural areas, the data hasn't yet supported a change to the status quo. And while that still may be the case, as we look ahead to more people coming into the state starting in September, and knowing Vermonters will be getting together inside as the temperature drops, coupled with these troubling regional and national trends, we've been trying to anticipate the appropriate time to deploy this tool, as well as others, so we keep one step ahead of the virus and don't meet the same fate other states are experiencing right now. And if it continues to look like this fire could be headed back towards us, an expanded mass policy will be part of the mix. We'll have more information by Friday when Commissioner Pichek presents the regional data. Again, Vermonters have done a great job protecting each other and made tremendous sacrifices. But I know many are tired of doing so and just want things back to normal. But the fact is, this virus is going to be with us for a while and will be until a vaccine is in place and distributed. What we're seeing in states that open too quickly, to just flip the switch, is a cautionary tale for us here in Vermont. I know how concerning this is. I get the frustration. But the smarter we are, the better off we'll be. This means keeping six feet apart, wearing a mask when around others, whether it's mandatory or not, washing your hands a lot, and staying home when sick. It also means being smart about where you travel and only go to places we've identified as low risk and quarantining for 14 days if you're traveling from other, any other locations or if you're taking a flight or other public transportation to get here from anywhere. Following this guidance and being smart about how we interact with each other is the best way to control it. If we do, we can keep things open, get our kids back to school in some capacity, protect our healthcare workers in the healthcare system, and continue to lead the country in how we respond to this virus. It continues to take all of us working towards a common goal. And as I said many times, 
This is literally in our hands. I thank you all for what you've done and what you'll need to do in the future. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> I'll start with just a very quick update on uh, our data. 1,366 cases as of yesterday, <clears throat> 1148 recovered, that's 56. Slope of the curve unchanged. And the slide I want you to focus on, uh, especially for when I discuss the um, Bennington Wyndham County experience later in my comments, is just noticing the numbers of cases on a daily basis. Not radically different in the recent weeks since they have been over a period of time. So Vermont has made <clears throat> the national news again, but in a good way. Not that we're accustomed to celebrating such events, but before the weekend, Vermont recorded over 30 days without a death with none since June 16th. And from a national standpoint, I believe this is unprecedented. <clears throat> I look at our surrounding states, and they are doing so much better than they've ever done. But they still report on deaths daily or almost daily. If we look at Vermont's rate, nine deaths per 100,000. That compares with anywhere from 29 to 165 per 100,000 in the entire Northeast region. As you're aware from uh, previous uh, discussions I've had on the topic, a slight majority of the Vermont deaths have occurred inside of long-term care facilities like nursing homes. <clears throat> and we have since instituted very strict protocols for these facilities including only recently relaxed outdoor summer visitation opportunities and a rigorous testing procedure for newly admitted residents that requires them to be tested four separate times over the course of two weeks before entering the facility. We certainly credit the directors and staff of these facilities for instituting intense measures to protect the vulnerable populations they care for, as well as the families that have sacrificed visiting their loved ones. <clears throat> and we must recognize that the very phased and gradual reopening of the state, coupled with the level of virus suppression we have achieve, achieved through the cooperation and hard work of all Vermonters, has led to less active cases which means less opportunity for hospitalizations and serious life-threatening illness. Turning now to education, the health department continues to work with the education sector and constantly refine K through 12 guidance and listen to the abundant input and provide the most science-based guidance possible. I cannot emphasize enough how Vermont's COVID landscape looks so different from the many other states that have surged yet are still discussing reopening. Our state of viral suppression and our testing and contact tracing capability make the timing right here. Colleges and universities likewise are working very closely with the document that we discussed with Richard Schneider about two weeks ago on this podium. And they are problem solving together, refining the many stipulations regarding student quarantining, testing protocols upon return to campus, visitation policies, dormitory life rules and regulations, and more. From an informal survey I conducted today on my weekly call with the health centers at these colleges and universities, it appears that most of the campuses in Vermont are preparing for a large majority of their expected student population to return. And we will be prepared for that. <clears throat> Next, regarding outbreaks. 
there were really none to report on of significance, and almost and most of those that I've previously reported on are stable without new cases. I do want to discuss, however, the Bennington Wyndham County situation, which is not an outbreak. <clears throat> A total of 65 patients have tested positive at Manchester Medical Center. The Health Department has completed interviews on all 65. In addition, we have subsequent PCR testing data on 52 of the 65, or 80 percent. 48 of these, 92 percent of those, have tested negative, while four have tested positive and are being considered confirmed cases. These four are not epidemiologically linked to each other, though they make up two pairs who have linkages to one another. Through interviews and lab data, we've determined that 59 of the 65 antigen positives are not cases. In addition, during the time period that elapsed between Wednesday and Saturday of last week, through pop-ups, through hospital testing, through testing at local health offices, 1,613 individuals in those counties were tested, most at the Manchester and Londonderry pop-up sites, and all but five were negative. The percent positivity rate in the two counties remains as low as the state overall, below 2 percent. Therefore, we do not believe community transmission of COVID-19 is occurring. The clinicians at the Manchester Medical Center continue to work cooperatively with us and are just as concerned about finding the explanation for the discordant test results between antigen and PCR as we are. As we speak today, my epidemiologic and testing staff are meeting with the CDC to follow up on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. With that, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Calvin? All right, uh, thank you, Governor. So on Friday, I think it was, I asked about the $600 running out. Um, we only have a few days left. As you said, Congress is working on it. Republicans, they want some $3 billion, or excuse me, they want a billion. Democrats want some $1 billion. Um, if Congress can't come up with a deal or we, we don't really know what's going to happen, I mean, what is the plan for when that $600 runs out uh, and, and Vermonters are faced with a financial flip? Yeah, um, well, unfortunately, it will just run out. We don't have the resources to backfill that. Um, but we will continue to supply those in need with unemployment benefits uh, as well as the PUA. That will continue. It's just the additional $600 on top of that. Um, I still believe uh, that there will be some sort of agreement in Congress uh, to continue in some capacity, but, uh, but again, we'll have to wait and see uh, if they're able to be, uh, get to the table and, uh, and negotiate this. And uh, maybe more of a follow-up for Commissioner Harrington, he's on the phone, but um, I guess kind of a two-pronged question. First part, just hoping to hear where we are in terms of our trust fund going into the next few weeks, and then also um, whether this $600 is, is taxed and uh, potentially how many Vermonters are having their taxes withheld. Um, I'll answer the first part of that. Maybe Commissioner Harrington can answer the, the second half or somebody from tax, but I believe, I believe it's tax. But uh, having said that, our trust fund is in pretty good shape. Um, we. Uh, we benefited uh, from um, a strategic, a strategic uh, method of uh, making sure that we bolstered our, our trust fund. Uh, we had over uh, half a billion dollars in our trust fund when this started. And uh, to date, I believe the last report I received was we're down to about 300 million at this point. Uh, so we're in good shape uh, for another few months uh, if this continues. Um, so again, 
uh, with the number of uh, you know steady decline in those on unemployment as we open up the economy, that's uh, that's helpful. Uh, but it, but again, we're seeing uh, you know we're leveling off, and uh, we should be again okay for a number of months. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, do you have the answer on the the tax question on the six hundred dollars, whether that's taxed and collected by the state or not? Uh, so yes, and you are right on about the trust fund balance as of the eighteenth of July. It was. Two hundred and ninety-nine million nine hundred and eight thousand two hundred and thirteen dollars. So I was saying um, eighty-two thousand dollars off. Yeah, you were a little off. Um, the uh, with regards to the benefits, all UI benefits are taxed. Uh, they are taxable. Do we know how many Vermonters are having uh, taxes withheld? I I would think that. All of them. I mean, the, the, we had almost eighty thousand at one point, and there are fifty, 000, almost fifty thousand now. So I would, I would imagine all Vermonters are having taxes withheld. Is that correct, Mr. Harrington? Uh, so yeah. So um, UI benefits are treated like wages, so they are taxable. Um, not everybody elects to have take, uh, taxes taken out uh, at the time the benefits are distributed, um, so they will uh, be required to to record those as earnings when they file their taxes uh, next year. So um, uh, I can get that number, but I don't have it off the top of my head about how many have elected uh, to have taxes taken out up front. We can take a look at that, Kelvin. Thank you. Governor, uh, we keep hearing viewers about the your mask policy and the logic behind it um, and the gist seems to be uh, what's he waiting for wouldn't wouldn't a mask policy in public raise compliance and raise the rate at which people wear a mask what would be the harm? well again I, I, the uncertainty uh in in some respects i can appreciate um but um uh, you know the frustration uh, that many uh, have experienced throughout the country when they've initiated the mass policy has been concerning, um, and uh, and I and I believe that we could avoid that, um, and we have thus far. Uh, again, I go back to the data. I, I'm not convinced, um, and and it'd be hard to prove or disprove, admittedly, uh, but uh, but I'm not convinced that if we'd had a um, mandated mass policy two months ago. That our numbers would be any different than they are today. So my question would be, why not uh, continue to do what we're doing um, because it's proven to be successful, and to use that tool, keep that tool in the toolbox, and utilize it when it's necessary. And as I said, when I'm seeing uh, this wave possibly coming back towards us, we'll know more on Friday. And if it looks like uh, that's the case, as well as uh, anticipating more people coming into the state in September, uh, then it might be necessary, and we'll do that. But in, you know, mandates, um, people resist mandates. They resist being told what to do, particularly Vermonters, it seems as though. Um, I'm, I'm familiar, friends with, you know, uh, with many uh, who bristle at, at the prospect of the government telling them do something again. Educating uh, gives us uh, better compliance, I believe. Um, but we may be at a point where, you know, with other people coming into the state, it's not just Vermonters we have to worry about. Um, so this might be the right time to do so. So again, I would say I put our numbers up against other states. Uh, and uh, right now, we've been successful doing it just the way we're doing it. And it may be necessary to implement. Uh, the follow-up about in-migration, have we there's a report that New Hampshire is seeing some spike in children uh, enrolling in schools, uh, well, I guess fleeing cities or fleeing other places with higher rates of COVID. Have we seen any of that uh, yet? I, uh, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, and I watch New Hampshire's numbers. They've been fairly steady. Um, if their positivity rate is increasing, it's not rising dramatically that I can see at least on a, a daily basis. I mean, obviously, they're much higher than we are um, but um, in every uh, capacity, but, but it's not alarming. No, I mean children who, uh, children of parents who may have vacation homes in New Hampshire, for example, who are choosing to enroll their children in New oh. Hampshire schools 
Are we seeing anything equivalent in Vermont to this one? Uh, not, again, not that I'm aware of, uh, but um, I don't know if Secretary French might have the answer to that, but I, it may be too soon to tell. S Secretary French, are you on? Yes, Governor. I had a hard, hard time hearing Stuart. I don't know if we could yeah, keep the question a little bit. Yeah, Stuart was just asking. He said uh, that in New Hampshire, uh, there's been some rumor that many people from out of state are coming into New Hampshire and enrolling their uh, kids in uh, New Hampshire schools. I'm wondering if we're seeing uh, any of that here in Vermont. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, that we understand that if that's a trend in Vermont yet or not. That's something certainly uh, we could ask school boards. Uh, they're the ones that would be seeing uh, those those requests for a residency. Actually, I think usually we would start to see more of that activity a little later in August. But that's something certainly we keep an eye on. Governor, the given the numbers right now and uh, the possibility. Of Um, where do we stand now as far as uh, possibly turning the spigot in, uh, in the jobs area with uh, different, different uh, areas of the economy? Uh, do you yeah. see a chance that we can? I'd, I'd say we're in a holding pattern at this point. Uh, again, the numbers that we're seeing in California, uh, you know, I watch their numbers on a daily basis and uh, about uh, 10,000 uh, positive cases every single day. Uh, they have been uh, third in the country, or second in, the, they're second in the country uh, in terms of the number of positives. Uh, New York, by far, has been, uh, the, has had the most uh, positive numbers. But California's catching up. My prediction would be, uh, watching the numbers next week, uh, they, will, they will exceed uh, New York's numbers. So New York, I mean, uh, California, um, Arizona, Texas, uh, Florida, what we're seeing in the Sun Belt, is concerning to us and and last week as we uh, showcased uh, on Friday starting to see a little bit of migration uh, Pennsylvania uh, West Virginia Virginia and so forth so it it appears it could be ca coming back our way so that's concerning concerning enough so I don't want to open things up any further because I don't want to retreat I don't want to go backwards I want to move forward uh, so we're in a bit of a holding pattern at this point at about 50% is where we're, we're at. Right, I, I was thinking along the lines of uh, office staff, um, uh, manufacturing jobs, uh, trucking, yeah. things like that. Well, again, with manufacturing, uh, we're open 100% uh, in manufacturing. Uh, so uh, there are jobs available, uh, I believe, and, and they could continue uh, to open up. Uh, but as we're seeing the economy throughout the country uh, being uh, impacted, it has to be a way, a place to sell your your product, so they may not be up to capacity because they don't have any place to to distribute uh, whatever product they're manufacturing. So that goes for everything. You know, we're all tied together in some way, uh, especially here in Vermont. We're, you know, we're at the the whims of of uh, a worldwide, uh, regional and uh, and uh, national type of economy. Good morning. These questions are for Dr. Levine. Over the weekend, the company that makes the antigen test, Fidel, just revised its sensitivity to 96.7%. I guess I'm struggling to reconcile what you're saying are a lot of false positives in Southern Vermont with a test that numerous sources say is really more likely to land you with a false negative result. I guess how accurate do you believe these antigen tests are? And then how accurate are the PCR tests that we're doing? Thanks, Kat. Um, so you're absolutely right. We worry uh, about false negatives more than we do false positives. When the FDA first approved these tests, their false negative rate was at least, but probably much greater than 7%, uh, and possibly in the 14 or 15%. It's not believed that most of the PCR tests have that low a sensitivity. On the other hand, the specificity, the likelihood that if you don't have the disease, you're going to test negative, 
you know, seems to be very high with a minimal false positive rate. That was done, though, on a very select group of symptomatic patients, and that was done on a smaller sample size, if you will, because in this fast-moving pandemic, the emergency use authorization, EUA, uh, process is streamlined so that uh, capacity for the country could increase. The specificity has been listed as almost 100%. Now, anyone who's practiced medicine for any period of time knows you, there's really no test that has 100% specificity, but it's believed to be that great. So one would not expect any of the Manchester positive results to be false positives if one used that kind of a logic. However, as I pointed out, after, after significant epidemiological as well as laboratory investigation, it does appear that these positive results do not represent true positive results. So there's something else going on that I'm pretty sure we will uncover. Um, as an aside, uh, I've spoken with a colleague in another New England state, and they have a small series of individuals who had a similar situation occur where they all tested positive on the exact same testing platform and uh, subsequent follow-up testing of these totally asymptomatic people came back negative. I also want to make a point more for the public at large just in terms of uh, how we test people in general, this principle of screening for disease. And this has big implications because of the proposed use of these antigen test platforms. Generally, one wants to screen for a disease, meaning that you're screening someone who has no symptoms, feels well, but you just want to know, do they have something or not? Similar to what we do when we advise people to have mammograms or to have colonoscopies or what have you. Uh, we're screening somebody who has no symptoms, but we think it's in their best interest to have the test to find something before they develop symptoms. So when you screen for disease, you want a test that is very sensitive, meaning it's going to have a small number of false negatives. You're willing for the positives to have some false positives because then you're going to follow up that test with a confirmatory test that is so specific that it pretty much tells you who's a true positive and who's a false positive. The process that's going on with uh, these antigen test platforms uh, concerns me in a sense because many times they're being used for a population of people who have no symptoms, who are in a setting like Vermont where the prevalence of the condition is very low from the start. So it makes it challenging to use those tests as a screening test. The, uh, Health and Human Services Administration in Washington is now poised to be sending a lot of these machines out to nursing homes, albeit nursing homes in surge areas where we would expect the prevalence of disease to be higher because they're in a surge. Uh, but again, if people at the nursing home have no symptoms, we have to be careful how we interpret the test result that we get in those settings. And I think what's going on here in Vermont and perhaps in one other New England state can be greatly informing as to some kind of systematic error that's occurring with this testing process uh, that may inform the future use of these machines. Not meaning these are no good, just meaning that we'll learn where the Achilles heel really is, uh, be able to have that worked upon and make them a much more reliable platform for the uses that they're being proposed for. Did I cover everything you um, wanted? Well, so to the other part of my question, what's the percent accuracy rate on a PCR test that we're doing? And do you feel that the PCR tests you got in Southern Vermont were accurate? Sure. So um, I'm not sure I can give you a final number because I don't even think the FDA can give us a, a, a true number of what you're calling accuracy. Um, and it does vary from one platform to another, and 
unlike these antigen tests where I believe there's only two that have been approved, the PCR tests, there are a legion number of uh, antibody, of, of uh, PCR tests. So it's hard to characterize. We think the sensitivities are probably greater than, nine, greater than or equal to 95 percent, so making the likelihood of a false negative very low. And we are con using them as a confirmatory test, uh, meaning that we think that the likelihood is that if it's negative, it's truly negative. The uh, test, the 1600 tests done in southern Vermont uh, were done either at the state lab, the um, UVM lab, or the Broad Institute in uh, Boston, just like uh, the majority of our other tests that are higher priority tests uh, in the state. So we're pretty confident about the uh, reliability, and I think uh, looking at a total of 1,600 makes us even more confident um, with such a large number. And Garnett, the company that's one of them that's running them here in Vermont, the antigen test, says they have reached out multiple times to the health department to offer to run PCR and antigen tests side by side. They say that you've told them that you're not interested in doing that. Given the desire for more testing and a faster turnaround time on test results, why wouldn't the health department want to at least see if this could be a reliable way to supplement our testing capacity? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I haven't actually said what was attributed to me, that we're not interested. Uh, but the follow-up... It, it was another health department representative. Okay. But the, the follow-up to that is actually... Um, I certainly at this point would want to put a pause uh, till this situation is resolved, especially knowing that it's now involving colleagues in another state as well. And once that pause is over because uh, there's a readily determined uh, cause for the discordant results, uh, certainly be uh, game for these. Again, I, I do think the antigen tests have a, have a role. Um, but if you look at the uh, guidelines that the Association of Public Health Labs has put together and the WHO, they are heavily emphatic on the symptomatic person, who, again, you want to define pretty quickly, know what you need to do with that individual and not wait days for a test result to come back. So if you have an accurate test result in a person who's symptomatic, uh, in an area where there's prevalence of disease, um, you'd want to be able to move on that quickly. So I, I do think there is a significant role for such antigen platforms, but we do have to really understand their pitfalls and problems uh, clearly before we go full, full steam ahead. All right, we need to move to our next questioner, Lisa at the AP. Um, thank you. Um, along the same lines, is that other New England state, Connecticut? No. Okay. And so, <clears throat> do you have advice for Vermonters? I mean, it seems kind of obvious, but um, in how they should be be tested. Advice for Vermonters and how they should be tested. Or what kind of test? I mean, you know, versus antigen test or the PCR test? Sure. Um, sure. So as of today, um, there aren't that many opportunities for them to be tested on the antigen platform. There are going to be increasing opportunities as these machines get deployed more and more. But the, the probability, if they just wanted a test, is that the PCR test would be available much more to them than the antigen test. And because the PCR test has now been um, utilized so extensively both in Vermont and nationally and internationally, uh, I would certainly say they should be able to rely on that test and um, give it a little time and they'll be able to rely on the antigen test, I would hope, too. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Donahue, The Islander. My question is for Dan French. 
Um, the Islander is hearing from readers across three counties about concerns on reopening in their communities. And one major concern is parents trying to keep their respective jobs so they can pay taxes, mortgage, whatever, but continue child care options when their kids are not in school. Has the education agency mandated, encouraged, whatever, discussed, having a simple rule that children in the same family go to school on the same days so that the number of child care days would be reduced and parents a better chance to keep their jobs? Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, no, we haven't contemplated mandating that from the state perspective. Uh, I will say districts are going to have uh, flexibility in deciding, you know, to what extent they utilize in-person uh, remote learning or what we're calling hybrid or some combination of the two. And I think, you know, put the emphasis on district decision making. That's uh, precisely, I think, where uh, that type of feedback should be considered and it's most appropriately considered. Uh, so parents, uh, you know, should definitely be having that conversation with school boards and vice versa. Uh, and that's a very important consideration. But I think, you know, from the state perspective, uh, we would have difficulty, I think, mandating such an approach. And we think, you know, that's best left in the hands of local uh, leaders to uh, respond to the needs of their communities. Great. Thank you. And a follow up, Dr. Levine. <clears throat> if Governor Scott is uh, going to possibly move to mandating a mask, uh, which he mentioned earlier, probably needs some research and not just gut feeling to make such an order. I'm wondering what research or investigation the health department has undertaken in an effort to better understand the problem, why large numbers of Vermonters refuse to put on masks in public places, like at convenience stores and other public places. Uh, what, what research is being done by your contract tracers or other employees to get to the bottom of the problem? Sure. Let me uh, go back a step first, Mike, um, and just talk about research about masks and facial coverings. Uh, so the governor would be standing on firm public health ground at this point in time, even though you've seen the nation go through oscillations since March, where first public officials were saying, don't wear a mask often because they didn't want masks to be actually used by the public because they needed to save them for health care providers uh, because of the PPE shortage. And then suddenly the public was told to start using a mask. Um, the research is continuing, but the research has been more positive now in the direction of masks. And the research mm -hmm. regarding both droplet transmission and aerosol transmission of virus has been more compelling with regard to why a mask might be protective. So there's that in the background. I'm not aware of a lot of research that compares mandating a mask to just recommending a mask. So we should just leave that because uh, that's probably work yet to be done uh, and as this pandemic continues to evolve. When it comes to why a Vermonter would choose to or not choose to wear a mask, some of the research we've had to date, I believe, shows that about 85% of Vermonters will put themselves in the category of always or most of the time would wear a mask. Uh, so it is, a, it is a significant majority. There is a, a minority that uh, have a variety of reasons for not wearing a mask, and they're really all over the place. There's not one compelling reason. Uh, there's a small group that just don't believe in them or want to have the right to decide for themselves what to do. Uh, but there are others that are just not clear on, you know, if, if there really is a difference that, that it would make. There are others who feel that uh, they can't wear one for a variety of perhaps health-related reasons, et cetera. The health department has worked with a um, marketing firm to try to get even more solid information about this because when we get that kind of information, we can tailor our communication and educational approaches to the public in a way that meets the need so that we'll get at whatever demographic group uh, has whatever reason for not wearing a mask and try to address it directly uh, in, in a very 
uh, fact-laden way that uh, will perhaps show an understanding from a behavioral approach as to why there is some resistance. Uh, again, to try you to, again, that. through education, work that through. So we're actually working with the entire state government right now in a major communications campaign regarding mass, which you may have seen and will see more of. But then there will be some future guidance coming based on this marketing research, which is very new. So it's not something we could just learn yesterday, turn around tomorrow into a, uh, a new, an even broader campaign than the one I've talked about. Uh, because this takes uh, some intelligent design behind it uh, and, and some psychology. So do you have copies of their investigations or their surveys? Where yes. They did them? Yes. Did they talk to, uh, you know, like, I mean, they... This is talking to Vermonters. Talk. This is talking to Vermonters, yeah, a, no, a random survey of Vermonters. Okay. So, like, standing outside the... Uh, a convenience store where, as we talked in the past, there is a very low percentage of Vermonters wearing masks when they just run in to buy their beer, sandwich, cigarettes, whatever. Uh, they they targeted places like that, or are they going to supermarkets, or where is the research done on the phone? Yeah, th th a lot of this is not uh, standing in a, in a setting like you're describing. So they're not seeing firsthand. They're just hopefully finding people it, that say they're right it's, with. it's self report okay and last thing is would it make sense to have mandatory masks in place before the large number of university students arrive in Vermont to across Vermont yeah I think the governor's uh, opening remarks alluded to that completely talking about students coming back talking about uh, foliage seekers coming into the state in September um, anticipating that, but looking at the data that we have at this point in time and where that data is uh, directing us to. And we can get that data this afternoon or today sometime? The data that the governor is referring to, you'll see on Friday from Commissioner Pichak. The data that I was referring to regarding the survey, I will make sure my communications team forwards you because we have a brief on that. Yeah. Okay. Th thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Guy Page. Hello, uh, this is a question for Secretary French. Um, I have two questions, but first one for Secretary French. Have you seen any trend of Vermont parents in response to the pandemic requirements moving away from the public school system towards homeschooling or other private schooling options? Uh, hi, Gay. Uh, I, uh, yes, we have seen an increase uh, in homeschooling applications. Um, to where we can tell you to, to what extent that will play out as a trend. I think, uh, in particular, um, it was only last week when we published our guidance on hybrid learning. So I know uh, folks uh, like to understand uh, the options that are available. Um, you know, we could expect the data to uh, change accordingly. Mm -hmm. And how would you assess the I guess the rate of it of increase a, a lot, a few, twenty percent, thirty percent. What? Yeah, I think uh, I don't have specific data in front of me, but I would say it's on the order of like a ten to fifteen percent increase. Oh, okay. Uh, and will will the public schools be able to, uh, in some way, help people who choose the homeschooling option? I mean, are there resources that would be available to them? From the schools if they homeschool? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, the way our regulation functions with homeschooling, the parents are uh, more or less have to compile their own plans. Uh, school districts are required to have a policy uh, that describes uh, to what extent homeschooling parents can access or take advantage of uh, activities operated by the school, such as athletics or coming in for a one off instruction on a certain course. Uh, but that, that's really describes the nature of that uh, relationship between the two. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Governor, uh, do you have any information about uh, when the Vermont State House will be reopened or any sense of the process of what's going on with that? 
you know, I don't, a guy, um, I'm, I'm confident uh, they won't be opening up for their September or August, September session. Uh, I believe that they will still be remote, um, interactively or remotely meeting. Um, but I don't know about the, I, I think they're in the same position we all are uh, in trying to determine where we're going to be in January and whether, you know, a lot will depend on, uh, on uh, national uh, spread uh, as well as uh, whether we get this contained uh, and whether there's a vaccine available. So I think those are questions uh, that no one has the answer to at this point in time. Um, but that'll be a consideration uh, in the in, in January. But I'm I'm quite confident they'll be meeting remotely uh, in the August September session. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, go a little easier on you today than I did on Friday. Uh, I, I first was curious if there was an update on the state's response to the USCIS. Uh, layoffs or, or um, job losses, temporary job losses, and uh, what the state is doing to prepare. I believe they're a little over a week away, maybe two weeks away, a little less than that. Yeah, I may have uh, Commissioner Harrington answer on that, but what a, from what I understand, we're having difficulty receipt, getting the information from the federal government about who specifically is going to be laid off and, and getting information to them. Um, so. It's, uh, it's been problematic in some respects. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, can you elaborate on that? Sure, thank you, Governor. Um, so first off, with respect to um, the, the layoff or the furlough, you know, under normal circumstances with a typical employer, we typically, especially uh, one that's laying off a large number of employees, uh, we would seek to receive um, information uh, for each of the employees that would help us expedite the unemployment insurance claim process uh, for those employees. Um, specifically because this is a federal agency, that process can take a while because we have to actually receive uh, confirmation of wages from the federal government before we can pay out benefits. Um, so we have requested on multiple occasions to receive uh, the uh, detailed information for each of the impacted employees and uh, as of yet um, USCIS and the federal government have denied our request for that information. Um, we, we continue to reach out to them to see if we can, we can get that information but have not uh, to date. Um, with regards to services being provided, uh, we are through our workforce development division working with the local state USCIS uh, state office um, to not only provide uh, information to employees um, uh, through USCIS management, but also uh, we are providing uh, virtual rapid response services uh, either through live uh, meetings or recorded meetings that uh, essentially walk the employee through um, what services are provided through reemployment services and workforce development services while also walking them through the unemployment insurance process and how to file and what they can expect through that process. Um, so again, those uh, had began last week and will continue leading up and even following um, the date of separation. Um, but you know, our biggest concern right now is that this is a large number of employees who are going to be impacted. Uh, and right now, um, we're concerned about our ability to uh, um, turn around uh, those claims in a timely manner due to the lack of information we have uh, with regards to the employees. Uh, thanks, Secretary Pichet, uh, Labor Secretary. Anyway, uh, moving on to my prepared question. Um, I've been made aware of an individual that traveled from Arkansas on Friday, uh, arrived in Vermont by airplane, went out to eat with family members in a restaurant in Burlington, Saturday, uh, Saturday I believe, went to a fairly large outdoor wedding, limited to no social distancing. Um, I believe it was last week or the week before, Governor, you said that um, your executive order have people quarantined for 14 days 
when traveling outside of the approved areas uh, is, is rather unenforceable. Um, your executive order was enforced uh, in the earlier part of the year on a, on a gym owner who stayed open. Um, can you just clarify why, you know, it's easier to enforce that type of behavior and, and not necessarily uh, a, a travel ban? And, and if there was enough information, you know, couldn't law enforcement, uh, you know, do a little bit of investigation and, and find who is and is not obeying this executive order? Yeah, Greg, uh, I understand your point, uh, but, you know, common sense uh, would, would tell you that it's much easier to see a gym owner on Main Street in, in Rutland uh, that's open with the lights on and people coming in and out and showing uh, uh, outward defiance to the law uh, than someone who is coming in uh, through our, through our um, airport, uh, for instance, when we have, I don't know if we have 380 flights a, a week coming in and out of uh, Burlington uh, to use law enforcement to track all those, I mean, then just do the numbers. I don't know how many are on the flights, but let's say there's 385 flights and, and there's um, 10 people, uh, that would get you to 4,000 people pretty quick. Uh, I'm not sure that we have enough law enforcement to track down every single person coming in. There are signs available. Uh, we try to make sure that we, uh, uh, we communicate uh, what our expectations are but it's not a perfect system, and we just don't have the capability to do that, nor do we have the capability of stopping people. I mean, uh, you know, the Canadian border is one thing, that's closed down, but I don't know how we would close down, we can't close down our borders into New Hampshire or New York or Massachusetts, um, and, and then to track them down, so to speak, uh, would, just, would just not be feasible or possible uh, without uh, a lot of other people. Um, in, in the springtime, the state had a tip website up for uh, gathering information on, on businesses that were not following the executive order. Is it not possible to do some sort of tip line or, or uh, online system I think, for people I think, to Yeah, to Greg, I, th I think it exists. Um, so if you want to send a tip in, um, feel free. It's on the, I believe, on the public safety website, but maybe I could ask Mike Sherling. Which which site is that on, Mike? It is uh, still up on, uh, on the public safety website, uh, although we are uh, in the midst of exploring a potential pivot to a different mechanism. Um, and if it does get replaced with something else, uh, there'll be a flag up there to indicate uh, how else to make a report. But it's still up. It, it has been up, correct? It's still up. Yeah. It is, it, correct, Governor. Enforcement actively uh, following up on those tips? Uh, depending on the severity of the tip, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, uh, everyone. Steve, any KTV? And hello, can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Levine, um, regarding the the, the rise in the uh, in, in the caseload in some of these harder states, um, it's, isn't it isn't it tr also uh, true that the uh, that the uh, their fatality rate is exponentially lower than the the three states that had uh, had lockdowns uh, like New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, and how could we explain that? Um, I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer uh, some of that, but uh, you know we've learned a lot over the last three or four months. And when you compare, I think New York, who has the highest number of positives, highest death rate, I think there were 33 or 34,000 people who died of, uh, of of the coronavirus in New York alone. And then you compare it to states like California. And as I said in my remarks, or I answered a question earlier. Um, I believe that California will exceed uh, the number of cases, positive cases, uh, exceed uh, New York in the, in the next week or so. But their death rate, as you said, uh, death rate is far, far lower, down 
around, I mean, still a lot of deaths. I mean, it's 7,000 deaths, yeah. I believe, uh, as well as in Texas and, and uh, Florida, their death rate is down. So we've learned a lot about uh, protecting the most vulnerable and what we have to do to, to make sure that happens. But maybe uh, Dr. Levine can elaborate on that. Thank you. Yeah, not a tremendous amount of elaboration, but uh, part of it is the relative youth, I'll put youth in quotes, of the population that's been impacted in the most recent surges. Part of it has to do with, believe it or not, and I think uh, a lot of us haven't really kept up with this, um, the management of an ill patient with COVID has evolved. And there are actually, for the very, very seriously ill, um, more innovations in how they are managed in the hospital and in the ICU with or without ventilator use that have occurred. There's also now uh, at least two drugs that people will hang their hat on, remdesivir and dexamethasone, uh, for again, the very ill who are in the hospital, um, which um, makes a big difference. Uh, and using those drugs in ways that weren't really appreciated well back in March, April, even May, I would say. Uh, so that has sure. evolved as well. And part of the more uh, numbers in youth involves the fact that they are less likely to get hospitalized at all. But having said all of that, we do know that you know, if we look at July 4th as a major <laughs> time frame, two weeks after July 4th would be in the July 18th range, so end of last week, um, we would begin to see over the next week or 10 days if there's going to be a, I'll use the word surge in, in deaths uh, in some of the states that have had uh, a lot of disease activity because we know that that sort of decline in the health of the person who has COVID uh, and is going to get seriously ill for that subset, that begins to occur you know, two, three weeks down the road from when they first became ill. So we need to continue to watch that closely. Sure. Uh, doctor, I've got a question from one of my viewers. Uh, they had asked about uh, if, if the virus is so prevalent and we're worried about, uh, you know, the droplets and, and everything, uh, and I guess this goes to math too, um, why do they need to go way back in the back of your sinuses to get a sample. If it's that prevalent, wouldn't it be, you know, wouldn't it be present in, in, in saliva? And, and wouldn't masks only prevent, uh, you know, stuff from that part of your sinuses coming out only when coughing or sneezing? Yeah, all, all, all good thoughts. So um, the, the, the sort of traditional, we'll call it now, and time-honored test is the nasopharyngeal swab, which goes to the very back of the nose. Um, and some of the test platforms still insist that that is the sample that their statistics are based on for performance, and that's what's accepted. But we've learned more and more about the utility of nasal swabs, which are in the front of the nose, and can be done by the person under observation still have a specific technique and time frame they need to occur in. It can't just be a, a little Q-tip you put in and take out and send to the lab. But it's a little more complicated, but not that much. Uh, and so, you know, our hope is that the nasal swab technology will be the technology to go with because it's so much more comfortable for people and it seems to uh, enjoy good accuracy as well. Uh, the, the, like everything with the COVID epidemic, there's a separate supply line for the right kind of swabs, the right kind of uh, containers for saline or culture media that those go with. So you have to still be very careful about having the abundant supply to do that. With regard to uh, saliva, I'm really waiting for some real landmark uh, publications to come out soon because a lot of labs are looking at this and if they can demonstrate that that method is as successful as the nasal and nasopharyngeal method, 
um, that will become very, very popular because obviously uh, spitting into a cup um, is a lot different than having something invasive, if I could call a nasal swab invasive. Um, and I think would uh, please people in the public a lot more uh, who need to get tested. So, so that's something to consider. Uh, again, that may require its own set of uh, needs from a supply chain uh, standpoint, but we should watch closely in the literature to see when uh, that becomes something that's uh, real time. Finally, um, you know, the, the method of how you infect somebody else, um, you know, it's, it's in the air, so whether it got there through a droplet, through an aerosol, or what have you, um, the, the facial covering should protect anything, if it's applied correctly, should protect anything from the nose down to the mouth. So to me, it wouldn't really matter which way you were producing things. The fact is, the velocity of what you produce is going to be different if you're talking versus singing versus coughing versus sneezing. So it's really important to have that in place to prevent all of the above from being the cause of how one infected somebody else and how many particles then got through to the atmosphere. Because none of these, even the N95s, it's called an N95 because it filters 95% of the very smallest particles. None of them are going to be 100%, but they're all going to be dramatically impactful in people who are actively ill or don't even know they're ill. Okay? Sure. Uh, and Governor, I, from what I'm hearing, I, I think you might be right with uh, the mandatory mask thing. Uh, again, with an old Yankee saw, they said that uh, that a Yankee will do whatever they're asked, but nothing of what they're told. So um, I, I think that uh, from what I'm hearing, uh, the voluntary mask uh, request might yield more compliance than a mandatory one. But that's just what I'm hearing. Anyways, thank you all very much. Yeah, we're hoping the educational uh, component will be helpful uh, regardless of what we do. I mean, I, and I believe that we get compliance when people want to do the right thing. So sometimes it does have to be their idea, but we're hoping they, they'll get the right idea very soon. All right, Courtney, Local 22. Hello, can you hear me? Ken. Hi, um, so not sure who's the best person to answer to say though if you guys have the answer over there, but um, just in regards to college students returning for the fall, um, obviously, college students come from all over. Will everyone need to quarantine for 14 days, and will colleges be providing uh, COVID testing for them? Yeah, there's a whole protocol uh, that's um, being contemplated at this point in time. I think uh, different colleges and universities have uh, different approaches, but, uh, but yes, uh, they will be required to have some sort of tests uh, as they arrive. Maybe, um, I don't know, if Ted Brady or or Secretary Curley might be on, might might have that information. Yeah, uh, Governor, this is Secretary Curley. Um, it's hard for me to quote exactly what's going to happen, but there's a, a college research program that I'd be happy to share with you, Courtney. Um, it is uh, certainly following the state guidelines for quarantine in terms of where okay. people are coming in from and requirements on quarantining. Um, there's a host of testing that's required and some of the colleges and universities are choosing to go over and above the levels that we have um, established but more than happy um, to share that with you that that plan with you if it's helpful oh yes that'd be great thank you perfect you bet yeah perfect thank you chris roy newport daily express yes good afternoon I realize you can't stop it, but do you discourage Vermonters from going out of state on vacation, um, knowing what you know today? It depends on where they're going, Chris. Um, you know, that's why we have the, um, um, the modeling uh, that we've done, uh, and it shows uh, some of the, the counties throughout the Northeast that are safe to go to or, or as safe as we are. And uh, so I would say uh, if you're going to one of the counties that are deemed green on our, uh, on our map, uh, that's okay. Um, but, uh, but if you're going to a county that is uh, yellow or red, 
uh, then you need to take uh, precautions and you need to quarantine when you return. So green is okay, um, yellow and red is not. So take a look at the map before you travel. Uh, most, of, uh, most of Maine is okay. There's one county there that's been problematic around the Portland area. Uh, and most of New Hampshire as well, and I think there's one county in the southern part of New Hampshire. And, and some of uh, Massachusetts has opened up and a lot of, of uh, northern New York uh, as well. So there are other places you can go visit, uh, but just be smart about what you do and uh, take a look at the map and, and adhere to the guidance uh, because it'll keep us all safe. Okay, great, thank you. Joe, Barton Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Um, following on on uh, Mr. Roy's question, what has the state been doing to let people out of state know about the regulations? I know that as you come in to Vermont, there are signs saying to um, look things up on the state's website, but. Um, have any efforts been made to let people who are contemplating come to, coming to Vermont know um, what the rules are? I know I've had people contact me from out of Vermont asking whether they can come to Vermont, and I explain things, and they always seem very surprised. Um, so what have you been doing? Yeah, I mean, obviously you can go to our ACCD um, website and that'll give you all the information. Anyone traveling into Vermont, uh, our lodging establishments uh, are uh, directing people and pointing them in the right direction as well. Uh, and we have signage on the interstate, obviously, uh, but, you know, marketing is uh, difficult and expensive. Uh, we've we found that out over the years when we try and market Vermont in any respect. Uh, the money doesn't go far, so for us to get out, especially with the changing data, uh, is difficult, uh, admittedly difficult. Um, so uh, I'd ask uh, Commissioner or Secretary Curley if she could uh, maybe elaborate on what, uh, what initiatives we're taking, uh, but we're trying to do all we can. Uh, hopefully uh, the media uh, does, uh, does this part as well uh, to tell, especially those who cross into other, other states um, to let people know what our regulations and guidance is, entails. Yeah, Governor, to elaborate, our, um, our tourism and marketing team are regularly using any of the outlets they have for travel to um, broadly share our quarantine and our cross-state uh, travel policies. Um, and also, each week they're posting the travel maps on our um, Vermont vacation site and any link that, that they can that is um, uh, connected to the Vermont vacation website as well. So as you mentioned, there's a variety of ways we hope to get it out there. Um, we do receive a fair number of folks who are inquiring, ab uh, inquiring about it. Um, so we, we hope to catch as many people as possible to help them understand what our expectation is. Thank you. I had one other it's not exactly a question, it's a request, but if Dr. Levine would be kind enough to forward the information that Mr. Donahue asked for to me as well, I'd be most grateful. Thank I, you. I bet he's kind enough to do that. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> Greg, the Bennington Banner. Hello, thank you uh, for taking my question. Uh, these questions are probably for Dr. Levine, uh, no offense, Governor. Um, none none taken, is, Greg. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, I do have more than one question. I hope you'll indulge me considering um, that I'm reporting to folks who are affected by uh, what's going on here in Southern Vermont. Uh, I'll try to be focused. Uh, there's a, Dr. Levine, there's a fair bit of confusion about when asymptomatic people should take a test and when it would register an accurate result. And I wondered if you have any guidance to share on that as to, for example, is there a window from when you think you've been exposed to when you're most likely to get an accurate reading from either PCR or an antigen test? Yeah, thanks for asking these questions, because uh, I'm sure lots of people in any part of the state want the answer. So um, 
If you feel you've been exposed and want to test, the likelihood you're going to develop symptoms uh, would occur with most probability on day four through day seven or so. Um, so we're generally recommending people get a test on the seventh day if they can. But obviously, it depends when you can set up a test, et cetera, so just keep that time frame in mind. The, um, again, the antigen test for someone who um, doesn't have any symptoms and may not have any exposure history or whatever uh, would have a higher false negative rate than a PCR test. Um, so again, if you're asymptomatic and want to test, the PCR would be preferable. But let me just say that we have done pop-up testing for, for months now, actually, across the state. And in asymptomatic people, we're not finding many positives. People who just want to know their result. They don't have an exposure history or anything. And in fact, we're testing a lot of asymptomatic people because they must be tested. They might work in a sector that deals with vulnerable people, so they have a testing protocol. They may be a healthcare worker. They may be a Vermonter who did leave the state and wants to come back and on day seven of quarantine wants to be released from quarantine with a negative test. So there are lots of reasons for people who don't have symptoms to still want tests. Um, and those we would recommend be done uh, by PCR with our current state of knowledge. Okay. Um, perhaps this is a question that might not have an easy answer, but um, so many of these do not. Uh, why would a test of an asymptomatic person result in a positive finding if, in fact, COVID-19 is, in fact, not present? I guess that's, that's sort of the mystery about the antigen test that I'm trying to figure out. And I wonder if you have any... Uh, is there any indication as to why that would be the case? Right. So this gets down to what are the many theories about what's going on in our current situation. So I'll try to be very brief and crisp right. about this. I did hear you go through those theories yesterday on, um, on, on VPR. So if, if, you want to, if, if you do want to distill those, that's fine. Yeah. So, um, you know, an asymptomatic person can have a positive test on whatever platform because they're in that so-called pre-symptomatic phase 48 hours before they begin, begin to feel ill. And so during that time period, they feel fine, but you could find active virus if you, if you did a test. So there is that possibility, and that would be uh, what I'm calling a true positive test. Again, in this situation, we've interviewed most of those people now many days later and they don't seem to satisfy the case definition for a COVID positive person. Uh, and they've had the additional negative PCR test, uh, which confirms our suspicions. But, you know, if there's something wrong in the actual testing protocol that's been going on that led to these positives, whether it has to do with the machine itself, whether it has to do with calibration of the machine, whether it has to do with the environment and contamination of the machine. There are many, many possibilities, which again, don't speak to the fact that this test should never be used. It's just this particular situation, and perhaps the one elsewhere in New England that I refer to uh, may, may have uh, been suffering from. It doesn't mean that the test should be thrown away and never used again. Um, these, these tests will have a role for sure, and we just need to get to the bottom of this one to be uh, extremely transparent about what's going on and how to prevent that when future uh, clinicians use these platforms. All right. Uh, really quickly, can you tell us which other New England state is having a similar experience with antigen tests? Yeah, it, it was Maine. Maine. Okay, thank you. And um, lastly, in PCR testing, what's the protocol for determining a positive test that is is there any allowable presence of COVID-19 that would still count as a negative test in a PCR test? Or, I mean, so I'm trying to figure out if there's a tolerance or if there's, you know, if there's allowance for uh, what the allowance for error is there and, you know, whether it's set up to uh, detect a large amount of, uh, of genetic material or if it's set up to be very sensitive. Sure. So, so you're, you're sort of asking me um, 
what does it take for somebody who actually has COVID to have a false negative PCR? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, what we know about these tests, the, the PCR process itself, it's been described as exquisitely sensitive. So if there's a number of copies of the virus present in the secretion that is being tested, that PCR test should find it. But that doesn't say how well the test does in practice. It just says if I go into a lab and have a certain number of viral copies, will the test pick it up? Almost certainly. So the story really is how that's applied clinically. And could there be a problem with how the sample was taken? Could there be a problem with where the sample was taken? Could there be a problem with what the sample was then put into to transport it? Could there be a problem with the temperature conditions of the transporting or some other condition of transporting? And then could there be a problem at the lab itself with the initial step of adding a reagent to try to separate out the nucleic acid that's going to then undergo PCR? So there are so many steps along the way that if a test doesn't perform as well as you might have anticipated, then um, a, a number of things could have gone wrong. So the rule of thumb would be for a clinical person, if you're confronted with the person that you're convinced has the disease, uh, you may say, your test was negative today, but I'm really concerned. I need you to continue to stay isolated. We're going to repeat your test in X number of days and see what it looks like then. Uh, because sequential testing can usually then uh, deal with the issue of why did this person come out negative when I really thought they were going to be positive. All right. So we were speaking, what, one more quick follow-up, I promise this is it. Uh, you were speaking Only if Rebecca about, says so it's fine. <laughs> she says Rebecca, it's, is it fine? It's yeah. fine, apparently. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Um, you were talking earlier about the, the lack of 100% reliability for any test. True. Um, and I guess in a situation where, where people have well-founded concerns about the, severe, the potential severity of this illness, um, the lack of that, there's sort of lack of certainty that, that comes with it. And I think maybe that's maybe what sort of plays into folks' anxiety about what's going on. I wonder if you could sort of speak to that and try to reassure folks about sort of the nature of, of medical testing and, 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 and the fact that we have to accept that there are no 100% certainties. Yeah, so um, dealing with uncertainty is, is part and parcel of what we buy into in medicine when we practice medicine. We always know that nothing is 100% certain. But on the other hand, if you're thoughtful and you apply different tests and different uh, rationales, you'll, you'll come up with the right formula. So in this case, we've uh, had at least 80% of those who had a positive antigen test get a subsequent PCR, and they, and they turned out negative, so we can reassure them We've gone through extensive interview process trying to see if all of these people fit the clinical definition for the disease that the CDC has accepted, and many did not. And we've done just dramatic amount of pop-up site testing throughout the communities involved and not found an underlying level of viral activity that's noteworthy um, and that in would indicate community transmission of virus. So, that's about as reassuring as I can be, you know, putting all of that together in one package. Uh, together, I think it provides a very, very compelling case. And then we'll have what uh, fruit is born, hopefully, from our conversations with CDC and other federal agencies so that we can uh, really give people a reason for why we have the results we have right now and further reassure them. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your indulgence. That's my questions. Thanks, Greg. Liam, VPR. Hi. Um, Governor, do you expect to issue a, a mask mandate on Friday? Um, Liam, did you hear my opening comments? I, I, I did. I did. Yeah. I, did. No, I, I, I sort of want to say it. If you're looking for clarity, you know it all depends on what the uh, what the modeling shows. Um, we're, we hope to update that over the next day or so. Uh, so when we 
announce the modeling on Friday, I'll have a better idea, indication as to what we do from there. I would say uh, that uh, if it's not Friday, it'll be sometime in the future. I just sense uh, that we're going to have this, uh, you know, what we're seeing again uh, throughout the, the west and the south and up the east coast. Um, it looks like it is coming back towards us, so we want to prepare. And with the number of students uh, coming in in September, and as I as alluded to before, we'll have some travelers um, for fall, fall foliage as well. So we'll want to just prepare ourselves for that. Um, but we're going to continue to utilize our education campaign and uh, trying to convince people uh, that it's the right thing to do, regardless of whether it's mandated on Friday or not. Uh, earlier in the press conference, you said you're not sure that it, you'd had a mandate two months ago if it would have changed the where we are right now. And obviously, things are looking pretty good. Um, but I mean, you know, the evidence with the of you know the effectiveness of masks has been clear even kind of two months ago, or, or at least pretty strong two months ago. So even if it hadn't changed the picture, don't you think two months of people living with a, a mandate would have brought up compliance so that as we're seeing potentially a, a surge coming in the fall, uh, the situation would be more mitigated. Um, like, wouldn't more time have been good just for the educational opportunities of everyone? You know, we've, uh, you know, it's not as though that we haven't done anything with masks all along the way. Uh, I've talked about it almost every single week about it being a good idea to do. We've uh, initiated this mask campaign uh, initially when we started opening up businesses right off the bat. Uh, we made it mandatory for those businesses uh, to have their employees wearing masks. We made masks mandatory uh, for those on, on public transportation. Um, so there's been a number of initiatives along the way that have gotten us to this point. Uh, and I know uh, as well, uh, allowing municipalities to, to mandate masks, that's gotten us uh, further compliance. So, you know, we're moving in the right direction. I, I would have to, again, counter uh, that the numbers aren't showing what you're saying. I mean, I just don't see that we would be in a, any different position when our numbers are so low right now, the lowest positivity rate in the, in the country, the lowest number of positives in the country. I mean, it, it shows that we're doing something right. And uh, whether that's because we're, we're compliant by nature, we want to do the right thing, uh, and, and uh, that's been working. So forcing someone to do it two months ago who knows what would have happened? The resistance uh, might have been uh, counter uh, to what you might predict. Maybe people wouldn't be wearing them because the government's telling them to do so at that point in time. So we'll never be able to prove or disprove that, uh, but, uh, but I can uh, show the numbers uh, here. And the numbers show that we're doing pretty well. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hello, this question is for Dr. Levine. I understand that the CDC has just approved the use of pool testing for COVID. Will Vermont be using pool testing wherein four tests are batched together and tested? If all, if all, are, if all four are negative, those four are done. If there's a positive, all four are then tested. It's said to be useful for states with low positivity rates, and I'm wondering if that would help speed up our testing here. Yeah, thanks for that question. Let me just explain to everybody the concept of pool testing. I, I think you did, but they may not have heard it as well on the phone. Um, pool testing means you take a whole bunch of samples, put them together, and test them as a group so that you save on doing individual tests on all of those samples. So if you think ahead that they're all going to be negative, that would be a really good strategy. If that batch of samples came out positive, you would still have saved your original specimen, so you would then go back and individually test each of those. So say the lab does 1,000 tests a day, you might decide, well, I'm gonna divide them into groups of 50 or groups of 100 or what have you. So you would save on all of the supplies of testing that you use, the reagents and stuff like that. So, um, it is not a, a bad strategy. Uh, we haven't actually resorted to it, if you will. Uh, we've tried to keep things less complicated right now, and it wasn't that um, approval process that has suddenly been uh, in the newspaper since yesterday uh, when it occurred. Uh, so we're going to have to think about that uh, because you're right. We are a low 
uh, positivity state. So we might actually be able to conserve uh, a lot on reagents um, if we follow that track. We have a governor-appointed testing and tracing task force that deals with questions like this multiple times a week. So now that this is news, uh, I think this will be uh, something that we can put on their agenda. There's no urgency or emergency to making a decision on this, but it could be a, a reasonable strategy to use. Um, you know, I remind people on an average day, um, we may have zero to two positives or we may have 17 positives. We're in that range. But we're testing literally 1,000 plus specimens a day uh, across all of our different platforms. So there may be a role for this uh, when we have that few number of positives uh, on a given day. Thank you. As a quick follow up. Um, I've been looking on the state health, the Department of Health website, and for people who are traveling to Vermont and those are returning to Vermont, scheduling tests looks to be almost impossible. If I were to return today on the 21st and quarantine for seven days until July 27th, there are no openings for a state of Vermont test until August 5th, which is nine days after my one week quarantine. Yes, and, and that's a, a timely question because um, it, it points out the fact we have multiple avenues for you to pursue. So you could return to Vermont and in preparation for day seven, call your healthcare provider and say, I'd like to have a test on day seven. Uh, can you help me arrange that? That wouldn't necessarily have to be through a pop-up site that the state was sponsoring in any particular part of the state. That could be through the normal mechanisms of how the healthcare system gets tests scheduled and done. Um, and that's what we would actually recommend. Uh, we've also really started to partner a lot with uh, our healthcare uh, systems, whether it be hospitals, federally qualified health centers, or primary care practices, with this particular need in mind. And I'm happy to announce that uh, yet another bit of progress was made uh, just uh, in the last day with Walgreens, actually, um, in uh, Essex Junction. Uh, so we're continuing to work with the commercial sector, if you will, to try to uh, expand opportunities that way as well. So it, it just points out there are multiple pathways for a person to pursue uh, above and beyond what's on our website for a state-sponsored pop-up in a region. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I did reach out to a local health care provider and ask about scheduling tests for people returning to Vermont. And they very specifically responded that the system was overwhelmed. There were long waits. It was hard for them to schedule them and to go to the state of Vermont uh, website. So that's good information. I thank you for that. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Rebecca. I had uh, two questions. One for Jill, Jill Goldstein about uh, how the sole proprietor grant program was was working out just started and for Dr. Levine there's a situation apparently in Williston where uh, perhaps some children were exposed to an unmasked uh, child care provider and I'm wondering I know that your department is looking into this and I wonder if you have any update on that we'll start with uh, Commissioner Goldstein first hi this is Commissioner Goldstein um, the sole proprietorship program started on Monday, and I don't have the uh, numbers for you. I know there's a tremendous amount of interest. Uh, the way that one will work is I believe they're accepting applications till August, and we'll be doing a selection by lottery. So it's very, very different uh, from the way that we're doing the ACCD and tax grants currently. But we can get a number for you and get back to you. I actually get a couple of calls myself um, helping people walk through the, the application. It's a little bit more complicated than some of the other ones in the way just the website was set up as, a, as an FYI. And then some of the people didn't know that you could also apply for the EIDL, which I, I found kind of curious that they didn't, they didn't know that. How about for the, um, the, the ongoing grants that you've already um, uh, talked about through the tax department, ACCD, how are those? How are those going? Very, they're going very well. Um, uh, ACCD has 1,700 applications, 400 of which 
are approved, a little bit more than 400 are approved, and uh, checks are expected to go out this week on HCD. And I know tax had a payment last week, at the end of last week, and another one uh, this week as well. So uh, it's progressing. There's still a very robust um, review process. We have hundreds that we are reviewing and approving. Um, and I just uh, ask everybody to be patient because uh, it is you know, quite an undertaking, and uh, but we're happy that some people already received payment last week and will receive payments this week. And we'll do that continuing on uh, each week. Can I still apply to those? There's still money available? Yes, there's still money available. So definitely still, still apply and get the message out. And it's a great point about sole proprietors not necessarily knowing what other avenues are available and they are eligible to apply for the federal monies. So, um, I think that that might have been something overlooked. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'll, I'll uh, respond about the child care. Uh, this, this again gives me an opportunity to broaden the discussion a little bit. Um, the child care you're referring to has gone one full week without any reported cases. Um, the, it's a good example because again, as you pointed out, it was an adult who was the ill person initially. Uh, and then uh, some children subsequently tested positive. The bottom line though, again, it's the theme we've been repeating, is the transmission pattern is usually adult to child and not child to adult. Whether we're talking about child care or kindergarten through grade six, uh, that seems to be the way the pattern goes. Um, this gives me another opportunity also to really tout if I could, our success record with child cares across the state. You know, child cares were, were operative from the very beginning um, because of the issue of essential workers needing to have reliable uh, child care so that they could perform their duties. And, uh, and we've expanded them since. And this is not a, um, another occurrence of many. This is a unique occurrence, really, considering how many child cares there are in the state uh, and how many um, parents, children, and child care providers have had concerns uh, just because of the fact that we're in the COVID era. But things have worked out very, very well. Um, but this does illustrate that there will be a case here, there will be a case there. Much as like we're talking about schools and colleges, um, there will be cases in those settings as well, but as long as they can be isolated cases, scattered cases, don't occur with great frequency, and can be contained very effectively through the public health measures that we've uh, utilized traditionally, that's what's important for everyone to understand. Uh, doctor, I'm wondering if you, I know there's privacy issues around this sort of thing, but can you tell me um, how many children uh, tested positive in that case, what might their age range have been? Yeah, no, I, I can't tell you how many children, which should tell you that the number is not large because we usually can't give information when there's a small number because it would be identified. Um, and because it's a child care, I can tell you they're all very young, but I, I can't give you any more specificity about the ages. All right, great, thank you. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Uh, yeah, hello, can you hear? We can. Uh, hi there. Uh, my questions are for Secretary French, um, and I apologize if uh, these were asked at the tail end of Friday's conference, which I didn't quite get to uh, finish reviewing. Um, is there any data yet on how many schools are considering a uh, hybrid or part-time remote learning plan as their reopening mode? And if not yet, would you, and, and when would you expect to have this information? Thank you for the question. Uh, you know, we just released the guidance on hybrid learning last week, so I think it's a little early. Um, I am contemplating collecting that information on a monthly basis from school districts so we can understand the patterns of instruction that are happening around the state. Uh, and on that um, hybrid guidance, um, it, it focuses primarily on the requirements around taking attendance. Um, since it seems at least that a number of schools here in the kingdom are intending to adopt a part-time remote plan at, to start, 
Will AOE issue any additional guidance that details when uh, this learning mode should be implemented or discontinued? Uh, and especially uh, how remote learning can best be utilized to maximize student outcomes. Um, I know there are a number of parents, you know, besides the child care issues, are concerned about their kids falling behind. Yes, I think uh, it's reasonable to expect us to produce uh, additional guidance on this topic. It's the topic, as you know, that isn't really addressed in our current regulatory framework. So the goal of our initial guidance was to review the current regulations and to establish Personally, to what extent is hybrid learning permissible? And it is. Um, I think the other type of guidance we often produce are sort of best practice guidance or considerations. And I'm sure as the patterns uh, emerge and people, uh, you know, use their creativity uh, to figure out how to best to do this, we'll identify some really effective approaches and probably uh, codify those into uh, guidance uh, recommendations of best practice. Um, and uh, the guidance also indicates um, in the additional considerations section that uh, boards and supers uh, should consider policies that outline um, uh, the option of hybrid learning uh, and the process for parents uh, opting in and out. And uh, so it makes me wonder, is AOE's position that hybrid learning or this you know, part-time remote learning should be something that a family can choose or do individual schools and boards have the authority to uh, adopt it for every student and at every grade level? Yeah, I mean, the, the conclusion of our guidance in that section is that we don't necessarily have the authority at the state level to prescribe how it's enacted uh, outside of the requirements on attendance. Uh, our recommendation or consideration, if you will, is that there needs to be some uh, regulation of this at the local level and we think that most appropriate for school boards and uh, their administration to have that conversation. Um, you know, the, the bottom line in terms of our current regulation is that school districts are required to educate their students. Um, we're putting those options in front of them, um, but that's in, based on my experience how, how that conversation should unfold at the local level, parental, teacher, and student feedback at the school board level. Uh, but ultimately, it's still the school board's responsibility and the school district's responsibility to ensure all of students get educated. I guess uh, very quickly, uh, with remote learning now on the table, are uh, snow days a thing of the past? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we, uh, we don't have a lot to go on in terms of regulatory authority over that issue at this point. I think it's a, it's a great question and one we'll have to no doubt examine uh, if it starts snowing. I'm not expecting it to snow anytime soon in the next <laughs> couple of weeks, but uh, I'm sure we'll take this up when it's, it's appropriate. I think uh, the kids will be disappointed if they don't ever get that uh, one thrill. All right, thanks for your time. Ann Wallace Allen, BT Digger. Hi, this too is a education question. For the remote portion of the learning, um, broadband connection is still a huge issue and school starts in several weeks. So how is the state gonna make sure that the online option is available to all kids? We all know that some teachers have said that, you know, kids are just falling through the cracks. And Presumably, it's going to be a priority for you to get, to get everybody, you know, enrolled and actually doing schoolwork this fall. Yeah, I think it is a, it is a priority uh, that we need to do our best to educate students, but obviously, it's be an imperfect solution. I think at this point, you know, uh, what we're trying to do is to establish the public health parameters for in-person instruction. You know, there's no doubt that that's the best approach in terms of addressing needs is something we strongly encourage. Um, at the same time, we have to also uh, give districts the option to, the, to resolve the practical issues of implementation, such as lack of bandwidth, for necessarily for all students, um, or the availability of their facilities and so forth. So I think we're striking the right balance in terms of establishing clear uh, guidance on the public health position. Um, at the same time, we're trying to impart some degree of flexibility so school districts have schools uh, to address the, the myriad of uh, practical implementation issues that will emerge as they begin to implement the guidance. Uh, so you're sort of leaving up the school district to either offer in-person instruction or to find a way to supply broadband connectivity for people? Well, they have the option to choose among in-person remote learning or hybrid, some combination of the two. Um, uh -huh. In areas where um, they have students who don't necessarily have the best access 
uh, certainly there's a big responsibility to work, and we have been working very diligently with the Department of Public Service to address this sort of last mile issue. Um, mm -hmm. But those, those are considerations that are very across the state, and uh, to a certain extent, there's nothing to do with that. Uh, but we are we are working to address those issues, and uh, the legislature has uh, has stepped up and been willing to uh, focus some of the CRF funding on this issue as well. Yeah, but I can't see that that all happening by the time school starts. Uh, no, you know, actually correct. getting that last mile completed. Right. I mean, but that's that's the world we're living in. This is an emergency, so uh, we're doing our best. And I think you know the the best solution in my view is to provide options to folks to utilize so that to ensure that they uh, they can address the needs as all students as best they can. All right. Thank you. Kevin, seven days. Hi, Governor. Can you hear me? We can. Thanks for taking the call. I have two questions. One is COVID related and one is uh, decidedly not. Um, the first one is that I went to a restaurant for the first time in months uh, yesterday in Burlington and was asked to write down my name and telephone number to allow contact tracing if that's necessary. Um, getting back to Greg's question about, you know, people getting off airplanes, um, 4,000 of them by, by one account, I guess. Um, do we have anything at the airports that's similar, and is, is that even um, within the state's jurisdiction? Well, they certainly uh, have the flight manifests, um, so they know who the passengers are coming off the planes. And, I, and does the state have that information if necessary, I, I guess? I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, to be honest with you, um, but I would think that we would be able to get that information if necessary. Okay. Excellent. And then the next question is uh, more of a broad one, and, and it's about federal law enforcement. Um, what are your thoughts um, when you watch what's occurring nationally in Portland and now apparently even in Chicago with the president sending federal troops um, into those communities? Obviously, Vermont doesn't have any uh, cities with such unrest. Nevertheless, what, what are you doing or have you done anything or any outreach or any communication with any federal agencies to make sure that there's not uh, a similar overreach by federal uh, federal law enforcement officers here in Vermont. Um, I would I would say first of all um, I'm very happy glad uh, that I live in Vermont and that I'm overseeing uh, such a great state uh, and what we're seeing across the country is is alarming <clears throat> and uh, and I do believe that there's a federal overreach in some capacity especially in Portland at this point in time. <clears throat> But um, as far as reaching out, <clears throat> I've done nothing proactively to reach out to any of the federal um, authorities, uh, asking them to or not to uh, come to Vermont. Um, again, we enjoy, um, I, I think, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the steps we took in terms of, of uh, making sure we listen uh, and uh, we, we acted appropriately. I think led us to where we are today, and hopefully, uh, we don't end up in a situation like uh, Portland or any other part of the country, uh, for that matter. Do you think it's appropriate for the federal government to step in when local jurisdictions uh, uh, have decided to not, let's say, clamp down on some of the some of the protests in their cities? Yeah, no, not from my perspective. If we if we need their help, we'll ask. Okay. Thanks for your help. Katie Jickling, BT Digger. Good afternoon. Vermont has taken a more conservative approach in what tests, in what COVID tests are sort of uh, permitted and, and authorized by the Department of Health. And I was curious, as the state reopens and college students return and there's maybe a higher demand, whether the state's long-term testing strategy um, will have any place for antibody tests or antigen tests or anything besides PCR. You know, interesting when you talk about our long-term strategy, Katie, when this started in March and we've really elevated since then. So I, uh, I, would, I would say uh, that we've evolved uh, in many different ways and we've accepted uh, different platforms. and. And what Dr. Levine has said uh, today, and what I've uh, been saying as well, we're looking for partnerships uh, with some of the commercial entities, or we're looking for partnerships with the FQHCs and other hospitals. And we've 
we've grown a lot, uh, especially over the last two months. Um, so I don't know if we have a, you know, our long-term strategy is obviously uh, to have a vaccine where we don't have to have uh, these tests, uh, but we're always willing to, to look for something new, the new initiatives, whether it's the pooling or whatever it is uh, to get us the highest rate of return. So I'll let uh, Dr. Levine uh, again elaborate on that. If I could have only be learned so much from the governor about how to govern a state as he has learned about managing an epidemic, uh, there's not a lot to add to his uh, dissertation. I would say that we will still have a very open mind to antigen testing. I don't want anyone to come away from this thinking the door is closed on antigen testing uh, because there will be a solution to what's gone on and hopefully it will be one that allows that test to still have a role in any state's strategy. And what we'll have to determine with the antigen test is, is there a particular strategy to pursue that would be most high yield and fraught with least difficulty in terms of challenges of interpretation, et cetera. And I do believe that antigen testing, um, as it could play a role in a symptomatic population um, that needs a quick decision made um, could be a very, very strong role for it to play. Um, I think there may be less of a role for it to play in a more of a screening enterprise in an asymptomatic population where the prevalence of disease may be very low. Uh, to go back to the antibody testing, and just to remind listeners and viewers, the antigen testing is similar to the PCR with a nasal specimen. The antibody testing is a blood test looking to see if someone has formed antibodies against the virus, whether they knew they were ill or not previously. That continues to not show great promise in terms of advising individuals or advising work sites about should a person go back to work, be allowed to be in that setting, et cetera. It still seems to have the most utility from a public health standpoint uh, in terms of how much disease might have been present in your state over a period of time. So we're getting some early data on that from a very small sample uh, that we're working with the University of Vermont College of Medicine on. We haven't yet engaged in a true seroprevalence study, that's a very large population, that would require, frankly, a lot of uh, outside support. Uh, and we would hope that we could do that through our research platform, either through the CDC or through an academic medical center um, that is interested in having a large population tested uh, for research purposes. So I don't see as much utility for that now. Uh, people have talked about using it for eligibility for vaccine, um, but I think when, it, when and if a vaccine becomes available, that's not going to be people's ticket to getting the vaccine or not getting the vaccine because we don't know enough yet about how durable these antibodies are even if you have them in your body. Uh, and we would most likely advise people to get vaccinated. Um, the most utility they have right now, which is an important place for them, is for people to donate their own plasma to sick people who might benefit from the antibodies in their plasma. Now, there's a lot of research trials going on with that now, so that would be a very selective but important use for this test. Does that cover pretty much what you asked? Yes, thank you. Um, and secondly, uh, there's an ongoing rate review. Um, Blue Cross and Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP are seeking 6.3 and 7.3% uh, rate increases today. Um, when they haven't seen big losses due to COVID. A couple months ago, Secretary Mike Smith, who I do not believe is on the call, said he would consider blocking any rate increase from health insurers. So I was wondering if Secretary Smith or, or the state or administration is still considering that or, or whether um, you all ha have a perspective on that. Uh, you're in luck. Secretary Smith is right here in the building. Thanks for the question, Katie. I think a couple of months ago and still today, I remain concerned about the rate increase 
that Blue Cross Blue Shield and others are proposing at the Green Mountain Care Board. I've talked to the Green Mountain Care Board on a, several occasions uh, when I've had the opportunity and expressed that concern in terms of the rate increase. I don't think Vermonters right now, um, with the amount of Vermonters who have been uh, laid off or without a job, and those who are also struggling um, because of reduced salaries, um, should have to endure a rate increase, especially in those areas that we're talking about with Blue Cross Blue Shield. So I remain concerned. Um, I don't know if I have any power or authority to do anything about it, except to express concern, and hopefully that the Green Mountain Care Board will do the right thing as we, uh, as we move forward. With that, we're only a minute over, uh, so I thank you for tuning in, and we'll be back on Friday for our modeling. Um, thanks again.